Lord, I thank you for this another day that you have blessed us to see. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to break your bread of life with your people that hear this word. I pray that this word would be convicting to all of our hearts and convict us to where we want to change the life that we're living, that we live the life that will bring you glory, honor, and praise, O oh God. And everything that we do, we do to the glory of God. Pray that you have your God-like way in us, O oh God. Purify our thoughts and our actions, our hearts. Let it be steadfast in the faith of Jesus Christ, that you will be glorified. Father, I thank you for allowing us to be able to make it through the day, through the trials and the tests that we encounter. Now I ask the Lord that you remove the busyness from the day, from our minds, oh God, that we have a clear conscience to focus on you. That you would get the glory out of everything that we do tonight, oh God. That the word, oh God, would be impacting enough to change our lives and put us back on the right track where we can walk by faith and not by sight. And everything we do, we do to promote your glory in the earth, O oh God. The souls be saved, lives be transformed, hearts be healed. That your ministering angels will encamp round about us as we trust and fear you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We we'll praise the Lord God for another opportunity to get into his word tonight. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Last week, we began our discussion talking about the mind of Christ. And the key verse was 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. Let me go to the uh, King James Version. Give me one second. I tell you, these studies are really impacting in my, in my life. I'm not sure about anyone else, but I am really loving the teachings because it's really changing the way I think and the way I even view myself, that I can view myself after the, the pattern of Christ, that I can live according to the standards of God's ability to continually convey his word into other people's lives to help change their lives as well. Good evening, Deacon Cannon. God bless you for joining tonight. And as we began last week talking about the mind of Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, it says, who has, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And what this is referring to is it so said, who has known the mind of the Lord? The mind of the Lord is not understandable with the natural mindset. It's only given with an interpretation or understanding by the Holy Spirit. And it says that he may instruct him. Who? Christ. And Christ came as a living example that we can live, surrender, yield our lives to the leadership of the Holy Spirit, to be governed and guided every day in the way of truth and righteousness. And then it says, we, but we have the mind of Christ. In our study, it says in the Amplified Version, for who has known or understood the mind, the counsel, and purposes of the Lord, so as to guide and instruct him and give him knowledge. But we have the mind, it says we have the mind of Christ, the Messiah, and do hold the thoughts and feelings and purposes of his heart. And that is so amazing to know that we have the feelings and the purposes of the heart of Christ when we have the mind of Christ. And it's amazing how when we learn how to submit and yield ourselves into the will of God, that God began to lead and direct us in the same order of life that Christ has led us to walk in as an example, we can live in the same way he lived in this earth victoriously. We can overcome struggles and habits and addictions. 
We don't have to be victimized by the enemy, but we can continue to stand on the word of truth with confidence and boldness that Christ is on our side. Amen. We started out reading last week. It says, I believe that you have now made a firm decision to choose right thoughts. So let's look at the types of thinking that will be considered right according to the Lord. There are certainly many types of thoughts that would have been considered unthinkable to Jesus when he was on the earth. If we want to follow his footsteps, then we must begin to think as he did. And the way Christ thought, he thought the thoughts of heaven, kingdom mindedness. He thought the word of God every time the enemy came to encounter, to attack, to deceive, to manipulate, to lead him astray. He knew his purpose. He knew the feelings that he had in his heart. And the reason he came to live was to live a victorious life for us. Because when we encounter the same type of attacks from the enemy, we can overcome the same thing by the word of God. And that's what Jesus used as his weapon against the enemy was the word of God. And that's what you have to learn to get in the word of God. And when you put the word inside of you, the word will come out of you. Not only that, the word will speak for you when you are encountered by the enemy with temptations, trials, tests, any type of sinful desire, the spirit of the living God inside of you will speak a word into your spirit, which is your heart, give you counsel, give you guidance, give you instructions, lead you in wisdom and truth that you will abide in God's righteousness and live a victorious life. So we talked about last week the importance of having a new heart and a new spirit. As God told in Ezekiel chapter 36, he told Ezekiel to prophesy to the children of Israel that he's going to take out the heart of the, of the, of the a stony heart, which is the heart of the world, and give his people a heart of flesh which symbolizes his spirit. And Amplified it says, and a new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And this is the operation that God is doing in all of our lives. The moment we accept Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior, God does an operation inside of your life to take out the heart of the world. Before Christ, we're living as dead people existing in this life with dead men walking until the resurrection life comes into us and God's Holy Spirit begins to wake us up by the same quickening power that raised Christ from the dead has made you alive. So God says, I'm going to take out that old heart, which is a stony heart, that hardened heart, that rebellious heart. And I'm going to give you a heart of flesh which symbolize his presence coming to abide inside of you. Then he said, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And that's verse 27, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 27. And he says, and you shall heed my ordinances and do them. And it's so amazing that God had a remedy for the sin issues that we deal with in this life today. Over 2,000 years ago, way back to the time of Adam and Eve, when they fell in the Garden of Eden, God dispelled them from Eden, he had a remedy. And that remedy is the blood of Jesus that will purify our thoughts and our actions and cleanse us from all sin. So I want you to be encouraged tonight and know that God loves you so much to where he, he doesn't want to keep you uh, living in the same defeated life or defeated mindset, dealing with the same old habits, the same addictions, the same struggles, the same obstacles. But he wants you to live a glorious, victorious life through Christ Jesus. As Christians, you and I have a new nature, which is actually the nature of God deposited within us at the new birth. So because of the exchange factor, the operation that God has done in every believer, we have a new nature. 
So that old man, as 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So God made an exchange factor in your life and my life. The moment we acknowledge we were sinners and we decided to give our lives over to Jesus Christ and allow him to come into our heart, then he began to clean us up and purify our lives by the fire of the Spirit of God and the blood of Jesus to cleanse us and he washed it with clean water from an evil conscience. Romans chapter 8 verse 6 speaks of the mind of the flesh and tells us that death is the result of following the mind of the flesh and life is the result of following the mind of the spirit. So when you follow the mind of the spirit, it's life. You follow the mind of the flesh, it's death. And so many people go to church Sunday after Sunday, week after week, and they're still spiritually dead. They have never came to the fact of accepting the new life within their inner man that will help change their lifestyles, change their characteristics, change their nature, change their DNA, change your, the way you behave. God has the power. He has the power to take away the things of the flesh and begin to purify your thoughts and your actions by the Holy Spirit, that your life will be the results to live in life according to the standards of God's word. I noticed there's a glitch in the system tonight, so excuse the glitch. I don't know what's causing that, but we're going to continue as long as we can stay connected. I just lost the signal a minute ago. We would make tremendous progress by simply learning to discern life and death. So there's something very important to every believer is to learn how to discern the difference between life and death. Death is separation from God. Life is being connected to God. And that's by the spirit of living God living inside of you. If something is ministering death to you, don't do it any longer. If something is ministering, serving you, aiding you, tempting you to death, don't follow it. Don't do it because you will end up empty. You end up broken. You end up messed up. When certain lines of thoughts fill you with full to death, every kind of misery, you know immediately that is not behind, it's not the mind of the spirit. So if you're giving into the mind of the flesh, the mind of the flesh is death. The mind of the flesh is, is hostile. It's an enemy of God. And the enemy wants to feed your mind with death to assassinate the mind of Christ, the nature of Christ, the purpose of Christ, the desires of Christ, the life of Christ that's inside of you. But it's up to you to maintain a righteous stand by staying consecrated. Stay in the word of God. Keep the word in your spirit. Because the more you keep the word connected to you, you're connected to the vine which produces life. Jesus says in St. John 15, chapter 1, that his father is the vine, is the vine, vine dresser, and he, he's the vine, and we have to stay connected to the vine. We abide in him, he abides in us. But the opposite of that is you don't abide in him, you're connected to a place of separation, which is death which caused the life to be sucked out of you, and the life of Christ has no power or influence in your life. So many people struggle with the same habits, the same addictions, the same things that they dealt with 10 years ago still has a stronghold in their lives. We all have something in our lives that God is not pleased with. From the pastor to the poor to the, to the to the people in the congregation, every individual in Christ Jesus got something in their life that's not of God, and we have to recognize what that thing is in our lives and allow the Holy Spirit to bring clarity, understanding of what it is, in order for that thing to be assassinated, to be purged out of your life. So we gotta continue to stay in God's Word, study the Word of God.
Know the word of God. Meditate on the word of God. Because the more you know, the more you be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God bless you, Wester. Thank you for joining. It is very helpful to a believer to learn to discern life and death within himself. You got to know what's inside of you that's not of God, that's producing death. And death will begin to cause you to shrivel up. It'll make you sick. And it causes you to lose the promises, the blessings God has for your life because you're separated from the vine. Death separates. The life of Christ connects you to his DNA, his nature, his characteristics, to the mind of Christ. And when you're connected to the mind of Christ, your thought life begins to change. Your actions begin to change because right actions follow right thinking. If you don't have your mind in the right place it needs to be in Christ Jesus, you're going to have yourself disconnected from the mind of Christ, which wrong actions produce wrong thinking. So the more you try to overcome certain habits and things and struggles and sicknesses and diseases in your life, it becomes a struggle. And that's what the enemy wants to do is assassinate the plan and purpose that God has for your life. God has a destiny for every born again believer. And the enemy knows that that destiny, it leads you to a place of prosperity. But the enemy wants to blind you from the truth of who you are. I was watching Manifest about a few weeks ago. It's a TV show where these people, it's 100, I think 190 people was on an airplane and the plane disappeared in a storm. And as the show went on, everyone kept talking about they were having a calling upon their life. People were hearing voices, telling them to go certain places, save people. Different things were happening in their life, which all bore down to the end of the, chat of, the, of, of the series where everyone kept talking about hold to your truth, hold to your truth. The truth came out that the plane had been destroyed in the beginning five years before the people came back to life. They were resurrected back to life. And no one knew this to the end of the show that they were resurrected. And they were resurrected with a purpose to help change other people's lives concerning how they're living. You know, I found that fascinating because God does the same thing. There's so many people in today's time that did. And we as believers, we have the solution. We got to hold to our truth, which is the gospel. Not only hold to the truth, we got to know that we have been called to a specific area of ministry to reach certain people in today's time. And we have to have the holy boldness to proclaim the truth of God's word without fear, without being rejected, because people are going to reject you. It's just a normal thing in life. But you got to understand that everybody in this world is not going to accept Christ. Even God says he knows those who are his, but the wicked he knows from afar, because he knows there are going to be some wicked people in this life that are not going to have the mind of Christ, don't want to have any, anything to do with Christ Jesus. Their minds are warped, they're corrupt, they're sinful, they're wicked, they're hateful, they're jealous folk, they're envious. All these things are in the mind of the world. And they don't even have a attitude or inkling or want to change the way they, they, they're living, they're living, or the way they're thinking. So we got to think positive. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says, do two walk together except they make an appointment and have agreed. So even though we're walking together, we're not going to believe, believe the same thing. We all have different interpretations of God's word when God speaks to us. But what the word is saying, we have to learn how to agree to disagree. So how can two walk together and so they be agreed? So we got to come to a balance and agree on the same thing that we're still talking about the gospel. 
It was still promoting God's glory. We're still giving God our hearts, our minds, our souls, our wills, our emotion for his glory. And we recognize the importance of the life that we're living, then we can live our lives to the full in Christ Jesus. So tonight we want to talk about the mind of Christ, but in conjunction to the mind of Christ, overcome depression. Overcome depression. And we all have dealt with it or know someone that we have came across in life that deals with depression. Some are clinically de depressed. Some are mentally depressed. Some are phys physically depressed. It doesn't matter what state of depression it is. Depression is depression. Psalms 143, verse 3 through 10, gives a description of depression and how to overcome it. Let's look at this passage in detail to see the steps we can take to overcome the attack of the enemy. And that's what op oppression and depression is. It's an attack of the enemy to take away your joy, to take away your peace, to get you to a place where you're discombobulated, no more longer self-control. All those different things that, that God has given you to strip you of all your blessings and promises. Identify the nature and cause, that, and cause of the problem. So you got, number one, you got to identify the nature and the cause of the problem, the reason why you're depressed. Psalm 43, verse 3 says, For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has smitten my life down to the ground. He has made me to dwell in darkness as those that have been long dead. The Amplified puts it this way, For the enemy has pursued and persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life down to the ground. He has made me to dwell in dark places as those who have been long dead. That is a place of misery, a place of darkness, a place of separation. Dwelling in dark places as one who is long dead certainly sounds to me like a description of someone who is down as he can be. Notice that the cause of or source of this depression, this attack upon the soul is Satan. So the enemy that attacks your soul, he comes to attack your mind. Because an awful person to become depressed, you gotta begin to dwell on something negative. And then you gotta begin to dwell on your problems and your situations. And the greatest attack the enemy does is to get you to the place where you doubt God's word and God's ability to deliver you. Second, we got to recognize depression steals life and light. And the Amplified says, Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed and faints within me, wrapped in gloom, my heart within me, my bosom grows numb. So what the enemy does, he gets you to a place where you're oppressed spiritually and you have no more freedom or power to defeat the enemy. So therefore, my spirit is overwhelmed. That means so much stuff bombarded your mindset to where it got into your spirit. You can hear, watch the news so much and all they feed is negativity. And the more negative stuff you hear, eventually begins to steal your joy because it gets in your spirit. Not only gets in your spirit, becomes overwhelming to it weighs you down to a place of misery. Then you get into a dark place. Depression oppressed the person's spiritual freedom and power. Our spirit empowered and encouraged by God's spirit is powerful and free. Our spirit empowered and encouraged by God's spirit is powerful and free. Therefore, Satan seeks to oppress its power and ability by filling our minds with darkness and gloom. That is the, where the enemy attacks you the most because he knows I can get you a place of misery and gloom. I can stop you from seeing and believing what God says about you. Please realize that it's vital to resist the feelings called depression immediately. 
So when the enemy tries to bring you to a place, let's say, for example, you get up in the morning and you go to work. You're full of joy. You're excited. You're refreshed to start the new day. And you go to work. A customer comes in with a negative foul spirit on them. And they begin to mistreat you, slander you, <clears throat> talk to you harshly. And all of a sudden, the excitement and the joy you had when you came to work has been slowly depressed and suppressed. So all of a sudden now, your attitude is shifting one who was once full of joy and excitement now becoming aggressive and angry because you allow that spirit from the other individual to connect to your spirit and to de depress your spirit from walking in the joy of the Lord as your strength. So your strength becomes weakened. And the enemy knows that once I can de defeat you, I can stop you in your tracks from living a healthy and a fruitful life. So you got to overcome depression immediately. Once you feel that thing trying to come upon you, you got to sense what it is and where it's coming from. And what I've done years ago, I learned this years ago, when the enemy comes to me and try to depress me, I speak to the spirit. I say, spirit, in the name of Jesus of depression, you have no authority, you have no power, you have no right to attack my mind or connect to my spirit. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and I command you to get out of here. And guess what happened? The spirit leaves. Because if you don't identify the spirit behind the spirit, the enemy will come into your life and depress you and suppress you and oppress you and bring you to a place of gloom and doom and darkness. And every time someone come around you, all of a sudden now your attitude has changed and you're lashing out at people because you're miserable and misery loves company. So because I'm miserable, I'm going to project my misery on you. So you come to me, I'm having a bad day, I'm going to ruin your day. Because now I'm entertaining an unclean spirit that attached itself to my spirit, which caused me to be aggressive, angry, and miserable. So now anyone comes around me, I'm projecting it. I'm sending out the same energy, the negative energy. My sister, one of my youngest sisters, <clears throat> she taught me years ago that we don't have to entertain negative energy. Negative energy, we've been talking about the mind and strongholds and bondages of sin for so long. And negative energy is a force that comes from the enemy to ruin your day. Because if he can project negative energy on you, he can begin to change your mindset from seeing yourself free in Christ Jesus. So if you're not free in Christ, Guess where you are? You're in bondage to the things of the enemy. And so you got to recognize what is producing life and what's producing death in my mindset. So to overcome depression, you got to recognize what it is, where it comes from, identify the nature and the cause of that thing. Second, recognize that depression steals life and light. And the light he's talking about, the light of Christ. The enemy steals your life because he came to steal, kill, and destroy. And when you give him the power and the influence over your life, he comes in. And guess what he does? He takes residency in your heart to suck out your life source and to, be to put the light that once shined bright inside of you becomes dim. So now he wants to stop you from being fruitful and abundant in the kingdom of God. So we got to pay attention when the enemy comes in like a flood and know, hey, this is not of God. I'm not going to accept this. I rebuke this in Jesus' name. Thirdly, 
Remember the good times. Psalms 143 verse 5 says, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your doings. I ponder the works of your hand. I love that scripture. It's one of the scriptures I, I don't mind reading on a daily basis because it's giving you instruction. It's giving you counsel on what you need to do and how you need to allow the Spirit of God to overcome the enemy in your life. So he says, I remember the days of old. So you can reflect back on many times you were in a, a place where you couldn't deliver yourself, how God brought you through. You're in a situation you were in prison to. God delivered you. Remember the miracles and the wonders he done in your life, how he healed and set you free. Reflect on all the things that God done for you and allow the Spirit of God to bring your heart to a place of rest. Well, instead of giving thought to the enemy thoughts, I'm resting in the finished work of the cross. In this verse, we see the psalmist's response to his condition. And so what David is doing is our writer, he's responding to depression, remembering, meditating, and pondering are all functions of the mind. And we all know that on a daily basis, that's exactly what happens in our mind. We remember things, we meditate on things, and we ponder. That means you nurse, you curse, and rehearse certain things over in your mind. You nurse, you curse, and rehearse certain things in your mind. So we got to turn around, reverse the curse, begin to remember the things of God, meditate on God's word, and meditate on what he's done for you, how he delivered, and ponder how God always keeps on blessing you every day. He keeps on making a way for you. He keeps on opening doors in your life. He keeps on calling checks to come in the mail, unexpected blessings to flow into your hand. Keep on reminding yourself that as I stay connected to the vine, he said the branches that does not bear fruit, he prunes, he cuts it away, that everything in your life will become productive, fruitful, abundant. Amen? He obviously knows that his thoughts will affect his feelings. So he gets busy thinking about the kind of things that will help him overcome the attacks upon his mind. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So that's what God wants to do is bring it to the place where we recognize all the good things he's done for us. Because God is so good. He's amazing. He's amazing. Give me one second. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm loving this lesson. I'm loving this lesson tonight. Amen. Number four. Praise the Lord in the midst of the problem. And this is one thing. It takes practice. I'm going to tell you that now. If you think the enemy been messing with you for a very long time, and, and it's like every time you, you turn around, something wrong is happening, we have to get to the place to have a 2020 vision where we focus on God and not the conditions. A lot of people in the body of Christ focus on their conditions and don't focus on the Lord. We're focused on our habits. We're focused on the enticements of the flesh. We're focused on people, places, and things but we don't focus on the Lord. And one thing I have to learn is that just because I'm having a bad day, it's not the end of my life. Just because bad things happen to good people doesn't determine that's how your life is going to continue to flow. You got to recognize when bad things happen to you that God still gets the glory. 
You got to praise him anyhow. Praise him in advance for your victory. Praise him in the storms of life when the pressure comes on. Praise him anyhow because when you praise God, the devil has no power or influence over your life to destroy you until you give him the power. You got people in the body of Christ that are still alcoholics. They're still drug addicts. They're addicted to cigarettes. They're addicted to pornography. They're addicted to all manner of evil, wickedness. And God is not pleased with us as the people of the Lord who keeps giving to these type of behaviors. We got to recognize the spirit that's behind the stuff that influenced us to do wrong. And overcome that thing by learning. I say it all the time. Learning how to put the word of God in you. When you deposit the word inside of you, the word comes out at the time when temptation comes. When the enemy wants to entice you to do evil and all manner of wickedness. The spirit of God inside is going to remind you of the word of God. That, hey, greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. I have overcome the world, therefore don't lose heart. You know, because greater is he that is in you. If the greater one lives inside of you, there is no temptation taking us but such as common to man. But God is faithful who will with the temptation make a way to escape that you and I may be able to bear it. In other words, God will not allow anything to attack itself to you that you can't bear. He will not allow anything to attach itself to you that you can't bear. He knows our strength. He knows our weaknesses. He knows when we're able to, to overcome certain things. He knows we don't have the power to overcome certain things. And that's when grace kicks in. The grace of God. When I don't have the ability to fix my life, the grace of God kicks in and says, guess what? The sacrifice has been made for you already. The price has been paid for your redemption. Therefore, meditate on the word of God day and night. And you shall make your way prosperous. If you keep the word in your mouth and keep it in your heart, and don't let it depart from you. Because it's very vital to our Christian walk of life to keep the word of God in our hearts and speak the word of God over our families, over our children, over ourselves. The more I speak the word over myself, the more victory I receive in myself, the stronger I become in Christ Jesus. Because the devil is a liar. You don't have to stay bound to sin. He said, no adultery, no liar, no homosexual, no fornicator, no idolater shall inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter what lifestyle you're living. If it's not in the right way God designed for you to be, he said, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. We got people to teach, oh, God will take a homosexual to heaven. No, you won't. It's in the book. God will take a drunkard to heaven. No, you won't. It's in the book. Are you taking a diet? No, he won't. It tells you he won't take these things because God is a holy God. And God says, holiness. He said, without holiness, no man can see the Lord. So your conditions, your sinful lifestyles, the habits, the strongholds, the lies of the devil that attach itself to your spirit, God says, great is he that in you than he is in the world. In other words, he can defeat this for this purpose. The Son of God was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. And that's good, excellent, exciting, shouting news to know that Christ defeated our foes on our behalf. He defeated the struggles and the habits and addictions in our lives, and he gave us the victory. So all we got to do is walk in it. You have the power to overcome anything enemy brings you away. God's desire for all who know him is for us to become more like Christ. God's desire for all who know him, talking about Christ Jesus, is for us to become more like Christ. We do this first by growing in knowledge, in our knowledge of Christ. It stands to the reason that we cannot grow to be like someone we don't know. So if you don't know Christ, you can't grow to be like Christ. But if you know him, God's desire is for us, for us to grow in our understanding 
in our revelation of who he is. The deeper our knowledge of Christ, the deeper our understanding of him, the more like him we become. Another reason we don't know and understand Christ so that he will be secured in our faith. It says another reason we ought to know and understand Christ so he becomes secure in our faith. So we got to get Christ in our spirits, in our hearts on a daily basis. And one thing about God, God loves every universe, individual. He loves every person. He hates to sin. He loves us, you and I, but he hates to sin. That's why he sent Jesus to be the sacrifice for our sins and iniquity, that through him we might obtain life and that more abundantly. So, number four, praise the Lord in the midst of problems. I spread forth my hands to you. My soul thirsts after you like a thirst, thirsty land for water. Selah. Pause and calmly think of that. Psalms 143, verse 6. So think about it. I spread my hands to you. My soul thirsts after the you for, for like a thirsty land. So like a land that's dry, a barren place. He's talking about we're thirsting after him. The psalmist knows the importance of praise. He lifts his hands in worship. He declares what we need is truly is he, he needs God. Only the Lord can cause him to feel satisfied. Only the Lord can cause you and I to be satisfied every day of our life. When we desire and thirst for him, blessed is the man who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He shall be filled. God knows our desires. He knows our wants. And we all have a need for Jesus Christ in our lives. And God promises, just like David says here, I spread my hands to you. In other words, worshiping you. My soul thirsts after thee like a thirsty land. Far too often, when people get depressed, it is because they are in need of something and they seek, seek it in the wrong place, which only adds to their problem. This is a very vital point. Very vital point. Many times when people are depressed, they have a need for something to take the place of depression but they seek for it in the wrong place. We all been there. We all done it before. And many times, it just adds more difficulty to our lives, more problems, more situations in our lives because we saw it in the wrong place. Instead of seeking God, we saw everything else the world can offer to help fix our problems. We go to psychiatrists, we go to the doctor to get medication. Some go to get, get a check to get on disability so they can have a reason to get some money from the system. You got people with many different reasons. Some are legit and some illegitimate. But God knows the heart of every person. He knows when you're, when you're serious about depression and you have a desire to want to overcome it. And he provides the remedy every day of our lives, which is through the word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit to set us free. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, the Lord said, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me for the fountains of living waters, and they have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns which cannot hold water. <laughs> so one thing about it, God alone can water a thirsty soul. God alone can water a thirsty soul. Don't be deceived into thinking that anything else can satisfy you fully and completely. Don't be deceived in thinking any other person or other place, the doctors, the medications, anything can set for, fully satisfy you and completely fix your situation. You will not find it in no other place but in the Lord. Chasing after the wrong things will always leave you disappointed. And disappointments opens the door to depression. Disappointment opens the door to depression. You got to recognize chasing other things to fix depression in your life is going to produce more problems. It's not going to fix your situation. 
Number five, ask God for help. Ask God for help. Answer me speedily, O Lord, for my spirit fails. Hide not thy face from me, lest I become like those who will go down into the pit, the grave. Psalms 143, verse 7. So ask God for help. When you find yourself faced with depression, faced with a clinical illness, faced with any other obstacle or trials or tests in your life that you can't seem to handle in your own self, ask God for help. I guarantee God will either send a messenger, he'll speak through his word to you, or he'll speak specifically into your spirit, something to help change your destiny and, and give you a whole, a whole outlook on something totally different than what you didn't see before. The psalmist asks for help. He basically saying, hurry up, God, because I am not going to be able to hold on very much longer without you. That is the greatest place to ever be when you recognize I can't hold on in my own strength, in my own efforts anymore, God. I tried to fix my problems. It created more issues in my life, bring, brought me deeper and deeper into depression. And I realized, God, I need you to come speedily. Hurry up, God. Help me. I'm crying out for help. I remember the time I was depressed because I had done something I shouldn't have done. And I felt like life wasn't worth living anymore. So I decided on a certain day to get drunk, not only get drunk, but take a whole bottle of Tylenol to kill myself and drink a pot of coffee because once before I tried suicide, and they pumped my stomach. But I said, this time, they're not going to be able to pump my stomach because I'm going to drink some hot coffee to make sure it dissolves in my system. I did exactly that. I took a bottle of pills, being drunk, drank the pot of coffee, dissolved all the pills. Before you know it, I slowly sunk, sunk into the floor and became a, a lump on the floor, and my spirit left my body. And when my spirit left my body, I saw myself sitting down on the floor. Not only that, I cut my wrist. So I was sitting in a puddle of blood. And I saw myself from a high place looking down in a low place at myself in this blood. And I saw my mother coming to my, my apartment while I was staying there. She called the paramedics. When she called the paramedics, they rushed to my apartment when they came in, they did everything they could to revive me and my spirit came back to my body. Talking about an out of body experience. We all can have an out of body experience. Every time you lie down to go to sleep, you're in the next step from death. And you got to recognize that it's the spirit of living God inside of you that's living in a body in your heart and that you got to continue to walk in the way of truth and the righteousness of God's word, because if you don't stay connected to the vine, the vine is the life source that flows from God to the Son to you by the Holy Spirit. If you disconnect yourself from the vine, the enemy will use everything he can to throw at you to bring you to a place of oppression and depression. Number six, listen to the Lord. Listen to the Lord. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. For on you do I lean, and in, in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way we're in I should walk, for I lift up my inner self to you. So you got to listen to the voice of the Lord, because in your place of depression, oppression, misery, in the place where you feel all hope is lost, your dark place, God speaks to you. And when he speaks to you, he would give you instruction. He would give you a word that would bring peace and a light to the dark place in your heart to illuminate everything the enemy is doing in your life to stop you in your tracks and produce life in you to begin to cause you to come out of that dark place back in the place of light and truth of God's word. The psalmist knows that he needs to hear from God. He needs to be assured of God's love and kindness. He needs God's attention and direction. How many times have you felt like that? How many times have you felt like 
you needed God's God's help so so quick. You needed God to come immediately. You need God to attend to your problem and give you direction, like right now. And this is what David was in. He was in a place of destitution, a dire place. I need you, God, right now to give me your attention. Come to my aid. Give me direction. Give me wisdom. Give me understanding. Lead me in the way I need to go right now. And that's where his heart was. And when you have that type of cry out to God, I cry to the Lord in the midst of my depression and my sickness, my disease. He heard me and delivered from all my fears. God will hear you when you have a sincere cry in your heart for his help to come in and help you. Number seven, pray for deliverance. Pray for deliverance. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. I flee to you to hide me. So pray for deliverance. So when you pray for deliverance, God will deliver you speedily. He will hear your cry. He will come in and set you free the moment you recognize I need your help. So number one, identify the nature and cause of the problem. Number two, recognize that depression steals life and light. Number three, remember the good times. Number four, praise the Lord in the midst of the problems. Number five, ask God for help. Number six, listen to the Lord. And number seven, pray for deliverance. This is the remedy that God provides for us when we face with obstacles and oppositions and trials and tests that produces depression in our lives. He gave us the remedy that you can overcome because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. That's the God I serve. And here we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. And when I recognize I made a mistake, I messed up, I come to God for repentance, God will deliver me and set me free immediately. Once the psalmist is declaring, it's a, once again the psalmist is declaring that it is only God who can help him. Please notice that throughout this, this discourse, he is keeping his mind on God and not on the problem. That is the key point that every believer needs to gravitate hold on to. When you're faced with your dilemma, your situation, do not focus on it, but focus on the Lord. And allow the Lord to deliver you and set you free in your inner man and lead you to victory. Number eight, seek God's wisdom, knowledge, and leadership. Seek God's wisdom, knowledge, and leadership. Psalms 143, verse 10. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me into a level country and into the land of uprightness. So when I recognize that I can't fix this situation on my own, I can go to God for my help. He will, te he will teach me on what to do, how to do, and when to do, and where to go. So when I seek God for wisdom, he gives me wisdom. I seek him for knowledge. He gives me knowledge. He gives me understanding. And I seek for leadership. He guides me. The problem comes in when we fail to let God lead us. We figure out that in ourselves that, oh, I can do this. I can get out of this problem myself. I can break this habit. I can break this addiction by myself. The devil's a liar. You don't have the ability. You don't have the power in your own efforts and your own strength to get out of anything the enemy brings to a place of imprisonment. Only God has the power to break the chains and the shackles off your mind and set you free in your inner man. But you got to be willing to say, okay, God, I've been in this place too long. Every year, it seems like the same cycle, the same problems come into my life, or the same habits begin to reborn itself again, like being rebirthed. Every year, I face the same giant. But today, God, after hearing this word, I recognize, God, I can't fix this on my own. And when you recognize and you give it over to the Lord, the Lord has the power to strip the enemy of its power, its influences, its control over your life and set you free 
once and for all. But you got to be willing. Say, okay, God, I need you to come into my heart. Just like David said, deliver your Lord from my enemy. I flee to hide to you to hide me in you. And when I recognize God, I need deliverance. That's the best place to be. God will deliver you. He will set you free. He will break the chains and shackles off your mind. He'll open up the new pathway for you to walk in. He will guide you the way of truth and righteousness to a fruitful and abundant life in the kingdom of God. Perhaps the psalmist is indicating that he has gotten out of the will of God and thus opened the door for the attack on his soul. Think about this. How many times have you opened the door for an attack in your life by something you did or said or thought? Think about it. Sometimes we open the portals of the enemy and cause a breach in our relationship with God to come into our hearts because of the way we thought or something I said about somebody or something negative I allowed to come out of my mouth or something I believed in my own heart that was not right or something I've done. And God is trying to let us know tonight you need to face your situation head on and allow the Holy Spirit inside of you to strip it of its power, of its influences, of its control. And we talked about this before in the previous lessons about the mind-binding control spirit of the enemy. You don't have to be held in captivity no more to a binding spirit of the enemy in your mind. But you can be set free. That's why I love this book, The Battle for the Mind, because it's teaching me on how to deal with habits and addictions in my own life to be set free once and for all. And God wants you to know tonight, my brother, my sister, that you got to recognize that you may have opened the door for the enemy to come into your life by something you have done. And when you recognize it, you got to seal the breach. You got to seal the breach. He wants to be... And, and he wants to be God's, he wants to be in God's will for he, for he now realizes that he is the only, only safe place to be. It's the only place safe to be for David. This David talking about himself. The only safest place to be is in the will of God. And that's where you and I need to be on a daily basis in the will of God. When I'm in the will of God, God closes the door. He seals the breach where the enemy has no more right or access. To come and go as he pleases in your life, in your children's life, or your family's life, or your generation, or your bloodline. Because once, once you close that door by surrendering and yielding and releasing your life into the hand of the Lord, God promises he will come in and set you free. Then he requests that God help him to be stable. I believe this phrase, lead me into a level country refers to his unsettled emotions. He wants to be level, not up and down. You got a lot of folk in the body of Christ have a, a, a mentality like a roller coaster. It's unbalanced. One minute you're excited, next minute you're miserable. One minute you're full of joy, next minute you're full of depression. One minute you're full of anxiety, next moment you, you're full of, of peace. God wants you to know tonight, you can... Stop the cycle of the up and down syndrome, the roller coaster syndrome in your mindset, in your emotions, in your life tonight by the Spirit of the Living God. We're going to pick this up next week to use your weapons because I guarantee the more we get into God's Word and begin to take what God is talking about and apply it to our hearts, just like when you have a wound on your arm or anywhere in your body, what you do. You take, an, you take an anointing salve of some type and you begin to put it on after cleaning that wound up. You put some type of dressing on that wound for that wound to heal. And that's what God does with us. He's doing it with the word tonight. He wants to take the anointing of the spirit of living God through Jesus Christ and apply it to the wounds in your heart that the enemy has pulled the scabs off of. Many times we put a band-aid on a wound that's, that's been healed, that's in the process of healing, and we pull the band-aid off and we pick at it. And guess what happened? Start bleeding again. Why? Because I, I, I agitated it, I discombobulated it, now I messed it up again to where now it's starting to have a, an infection. 
enemy does the same thing in your life. When God is healing and delivering you from anything in your life, don't put a band-aid on it and pick it off. Because the more you keep playing with the enemy in his pig pen, he's going to keep you like the prodigal son where you have no substance to live on. Until you come to your senses like the prodigal son and realize, hey, my servants, he said, my dad's servants have a better life than I'm living right now. So I'll make myself one of dad's hired servant and go back home to him and tell dad, dad, I'm not worthy to be called your child. But I want to encourage you tonight, my brother and sister, that if you're in a prodigal life and your life should be going down a journey that's leading to a place of death and separation from God, tonight you can be reborn, you can be renewed, you can be revived, you can be restored, you can be refreshed by the spirit of the living God, by the anointing flowing through your life from this teaching tonight. And all you got to do, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Even if you're on the line tonight and you know you've been living a prodigal life, you got to have his addictions, things in your life that's not of God, and you need restoration in your life, pray this prayer with me. And if you are living a life and you're doing the best you can to live a righteous life on a daily basis, pray this prayer anyway with me tonight. Heavenly Father, I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins, knowingly, unknowingly. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb and come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant that for the first time, never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God says that the whole host of heaven rejoices over one sinner that comes to Christ. And tonight the heavens are rejoicing if you prayed that prayer and you meant it. If you have been restored tonight, you've been refreshed, you've been revived by this word tonight, allow the Spirit of God to continue to feed you like a shepherd feeds his flock. And I guarantee your life is going to change to the, to the full of who God has intended for you to become and who you are today in your life to bring God glory out of your life. So, Lord God, tonight, I thank you, Lord, for this message, for this teaching. Pray that they have not fallen from deaf ears, but that, Lord God, you would begin to convict all of our hearts. Anything in our lives that's not of you, God, that you purge it out tonight by the Spirit of the living God to revive us, to refresh us, to restore us, replenish the anointing with a freshness in our life tonight, oh God, that we become more and more like you in our daily walk for Jesus Christ. And we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you pray that prayer, I just thank God for you tonight, that you stay encouraged, stay excited about Jesus, know that God loves you. I love you too if you desire to sow a seed into the ministry. I'm going to post the link for you to do so because I really believe that by sowing seed, God is going to begin to rain blessings in your life even more because of the obedience. It's not about the seed. It's the obedience of giving the seed that God is looking for. And when you be obedient to God's will to do what God has instructed you to do by faith, you open the door of heaven for God to begin to bless you even more. And that's one thing about me. I sow seeds all the time to, to the ministry, even in people's lives, because I really believe that by sowing seed, it opens the portals of heaven for God to begin to rain upon me even more blessings. The more I give, the more he blesses because of the natural law of sowing and reaping. But because we're connected to the source of our giving, God keeps on blessings anyhow. So you stay encouraged tonight, my brothers and sisters. Don't allow the enemy to deceive you and manipulate you to keep walking in a habit and addiction that got you bound in sin. But allow the spirit of living God to set you free in your inner man that every day you can live free, fruitful, abundant, abiding in the vine as the vine abides in you, connected to Jesus Christ, that you can live the life to the full that God has promised to give you, life more abundant. Amen. Until next week, the Lord says the same. Shalom. May the peace of God be upon you and continue to rest and guide you in the way of truth and righteousness. If you have any questions, feel free to inbox me. The questions on my Facebook page. 
uh, Pastor Charles Emery, continue to send it to me, and I will ask you questions. Share this video with someone, the guy that you to uh, share with. And I pray that it, it helps someone else, too, after hearing this teaching, because I don't know about you, but it's helping me. The more I teach this word, the more the word is changing my life. God bless you again. Have a good night. Shalom. Peace be unto you.